Uh, thank you, Nina, for your introduction. Uh, my name is Navid Mohebi. I'm a policy fellow at uh, NOFTI. I hope you have all enjoyed our conference so far. Um, um, the panel that I'm going to be moderating today is uh, kind of different from the panel, uh, other panels that you have uh, witnessed so far um, in a way that you may not have heard um, about this topic much, especially our non-Iranian friends. So I kind of wanted to uh, give you a short introduction, something that I wrote. I want to read it for you, why we are having this panel today. Today, I have the honor of moderating a panel on the Iran dialogue in media, academia, and think tanks here in Washington. I moved to the United States eight years ago and quickly began to follow the discourse surrounding Iran in this town. I soon realized that the regime I had escaped was a bit more popular in certain circles of media, academia, and think tanks in the United States, which took me by surprise. In analysis from these sources, I often heard echoes of what I would once hear from Iranian officials back home. I heard very little about human rights violations and the Iranian people. Often I found the Iranian's regime action excused by directing the blame towards the United States, for example, its involvement in the so-called coup of 1953, as if the regime were innocent and had no agency, rather than focusing the blame on the regime itself and pinning the responsibility of its actions on its perpetrator. We are often fed with the idea that Iran is a misunderstood country and that the country has a lively debate with elections with high participation ranging from moderates to hardliners. Opponents of the regime are almost non-existent and opposition groups are irrelevant. When mass uprising break, break out, we are told that it's merely because of raised fuel and red prices. Meanwhile, protesters are clearly chanting for the end of the regime. When Iranians see this, they take to social media to call this behavior, and call this behavior out and say, this is wrong. But denied the coveted blue check mark on Twitter, they are labeled conspiracy terrorists. But that has been changing. And this is why we have this panel today. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate you coming from far distances. I know uh, Kave uh, came from Toronto and our friend Tina um, uh, from London. Thank you very much. Uh, so I have uh, four distinguished panelists here today with me. Uh, First, Kaveh Shahruz, a lawyer and senior fellow at uh, McDonald Laurier Institute. And um, Gabriel Noronha, uh, former State Department uh, advisor on Iranian affairs. Uh, Maryam Memar Sadeghi, also a senior fellow at uh, McDonald Laurier Institute. And Tina Ghazi Morad, editor in chief of Manotu TV Newsroom. Um, a very popular Iranian Persian speaking outlet based in uh, London. Uh, thank you very much coming from uh, London to It's worth it, definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So I want to go uh, straight to questions, starting with Kaveh. Um, Kaveh, you have been very outspoken about the regime's influence campaign here in the United States and the West. Uh, what are some tactics that uh, the Iran echo chamber are using to impact uh, the Iran discussion? Sure. Thank you for that question. Before I start, thank you so much to Nufti for hosting me and also having this incredibly important event. Um, so yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of my time documenting the behavior of what I like to call, this is not a term I invented, but it's a, one that I hopefully have helped to popularize a little bit, um, uh, the behavior of what I call the Iran lobby. Um, and I, I think that term is actually maybe um, inadequate, and I'll get to why I think that is in a few minutes. Um, so the Iran lobby, as far as I know, um, as far as I'm concerned, is not really a lobby in the traditional sense. It's not an organization that you can point to, though there are organizations that are um, involved in it. Um, it's kind of a loose network of people and organizations in academia, in uh, the media, in think tanks, 
And their role really is to promote the interests of uh, the Islamic Republic in the West and to get policymakers to see the world through the eyes um, of the Islamic Republic, to see the world in a way that the Islamic Republic wants us to see it. And once you observe them a little bit, you begin to kind of see their methods. Now, very um, rarely do they ever come out and support the Islamic Republic explicitly. And there's good reason for this. And, and one of my favorite quotes, actually, um, a while back, the National Iranian American Council went to court um, claiming that somebody had defamed them. And the judge ultimately ended up throwing out the case. Um, the, the issue was whether or not you know, one can reasonably think that this organization um, is a lobby organization. And they kept saying, well, you know, occasionally we, you know, we, we don't support, we never come out and explicitly support the Islamic Republic. And the judge's response, and I, I think this is a great quote, was, you know, any moderately intelligent agent for the Islamic Republic would not want to be seen as unremittingly pro-regime, right? So the members of the Iran lobby don't come out and actually support the Islamic Republic because that would be crazy and they would be written off. What they do is, is other things, right? And I, I've, I've kind of tried to categorize what they do into different strategies. One of the, the key strategies that they have is that they minimize bad news about Iran. They minimize the bad behavior of the Iranian regime, right? So when, when Iran engages in some horrible action, um, they may put out a statement, but they don't talk about it very much. They just quickly move on. Now, it's important that they do put out a statement because what that does is it helps them uh, you know, say, it's not, we have not been silent on human rights, we've put out this statement. But when you actually do a numerical calculation, you begin to see they talk far more about other things than they do about the bad behavior of the Iranian regime. The second thing that they do is they put so much of their focus on the bad behavior of the Islamic Republic's adversaries, right? So the Islamic Republic carries out uh, terror abroad, it um, intimidates um, dissidents abroad, they have very little to say about that. Jamal Khashoggi, is murdered, and hundreds upon hundreds of statements. This is not in any way to defend, obviously, what happened to Jamal Khashoggi. We should all be talking about that. But if you are in the Iran business, it's really weird that you would be spending so much time talking about Saudi Arabia. It only makes sense when you begin to realize that their role is um, to put a spotlight on the behavior, bad behavior of Iran's um, opponents. They inject, and I'm sorry, I'm, I am going on a little too long, because I, I apologize to the oh, fellow panelists. They inject Iran-favored narratives into discussions, policy discussions, media discussions about Iran. Um, you know, Iran, the Iranian regime wants the world to think that all the misery that's happening in Iran is because of sanctions, right? Never about mismanagement, never about kleptocracy, none of that. The Iran lobby helps to perpetuate that story and push it out into the, into the press. And what they do is they also narrow the Overton window of things we're allowed to talk about in respectable society. So regime change, they very explicitly leave that out of the discussion, right? This is a, this is a real problem. And finally what they do, um, and they're masters at this, I've been on the receiving end of it, I know others on the panels, panel have been on the receiving end of it, is they attack dissidents. Anybody that speaks out against the regime, um, they attack them, calling them warmongers, supporters of sanctions, this, that, and the other. Um, these are their strategies, and once you see these strategies, it's very difficult to unsee it. They, they recycle this methodology over and over again. Now, the, and I'll, I'll end with this. The reason why I, say I, I said I think the term Iran lobby, increasingly I think it's an inadequate term, is that I don't think this is limited to Iran anymore. I think what you're beginning to see is a coalition of autocratic countries and all their lobbies seem to operate the same way. And increasingly, people that I think of as being associated with the Iran lobby have moved on to organizations that work to defend the interests of China and Russia and Iran, and they all operate with the same tactics. So it's really increasingly an, uh, a lobby for autocrats of all stripes across the world. Uh, this actually brings us to my next question for you. Why do you think uh, the Western institutions are so receptive to the message of Iran lobby? Hmm. Um, good question. I, I think there's, there's several things at play. One is um, these institutions, I think the ones that are most vulnerable are you know, academia, media. Um, these are populated by people that have certain prior ideological commitments, right? Their ideological commitment um, is skepticism about American power, about whether or not America can do good in the world, and that naturally leads them to kind of, when the ships are down, to side with those that are standing against America, right? Um, so you, you, you see this over and over again in the behavior of the Iran lobby. Um, the other thing that I would point to is that 
the Iran lobby is incredibly good at messaging, right? I, I'm, I'm not in the, in the habit of quoting Noam Chomsky, but one thing I, I remember from Chomsky is, you know, he was asked, why don't you go on television and do more uh, media interviews? And his response was, well, look, you know, it's very easy to go on media and say whoever the latest American enemy is, is bad. It's very hard to do what I do, which is to go on there and speak with nuance about, you know, the difficulties or whatever. Again, this is not a promotion of Noam Chomsky, but I think that point stands. The arguments put forth by the Iran lobby are incredibly simple for media to consume, for academia to consume. We love peace. Like, who doesn't love that, right? We love peace is a great message. For those of us that are opposed to the regime, we have to present a much more nuanced argument, and that tends to get muddled and lost, especially for people who are you know, not in the messaging business. How, how do they recruit their, their people? and put yeah, them in the right place. That, that's, that's great. I was actually just building to that. I, I think one of the things that they've been great at, and I would say the opposition needs to replicate, is they're very good at recruiting people early with these very simple and appealing messages, right? We want peace. And so all sorts of young people come, they start working for these organizations, um, and, they, and they become sort of evangelists for um, the Iran lobby, and then they go off into academia, they go off into think tanks, and into you know, congressional offices and so on, and then that message ends up being pretty much the only message that the media and acad academics and others end up hearing. If I understood you correctly, you are saying that you're trying to say because of the appeal of the message of peace and diplomacy and the effective ways in which they are trying to place the right people uh, in charge, yeah. um, their message is so effective. Their message is incredibly effective because they sell it very well, right? They're not pro-peace. Um, they're not speaking out for peace in Syria where Iran is busy massacring people, right? They don't talk about peace there, uh, but they do talk about peace um, you know, whenever it's Iran that's kind of on the, on the receiving end of any sort of pressure, mm. right? So they're very careful about how they phrase their, their idealistic language. Yeah, that's one side of the coin. I want to bring Mariam in. Mariam, do you agree with Kaveh that because of the messaging of uh, the pro-Iran lobby networks, they are so effective, or you think that there are some other factors that also plays a role? Yeah, I think there are other factors that, that play a significant role. I think I just want to start by thanking you, Navid, because uh, uh, Kava mentioned these um, uh, mob attacks uh, on social media that are orchestrated by the regime, and I've uh, every few months, I'm, I'm the victim of those. And uh, the, in the latest wave, Navi de Mohebi uh, was extremely kind to write a detailed defense of me. And I will never forget that. Thank you, Navi John. Um, if Iran is to become a uh, democratic country where people have security and dignity and human rights, it'll be because of people like Navi. Um, here, here. I think there's something else going on. It has to do, that does not have to do with uh, the Iran lobby, that does not have to do with the regime. I agree wholeheartedly with Kaveh, who's my good friend and colleague also at the same think tank. Um, what's going on has to do with the West itself, and in particular here in the United States, the US-Iran relationship. When Americans, and particularly this is true of the progressive side of things, and in academia and in think tanks and in the media, um, there is a lot of self-loathing and there's a lot of self-blame and there's an anti-Americanism that is internalized so that maybe others, maybe you have experienced this. When I meet somebody for the first time and they say, where are you from? And I say, well, I was born in Iran. Immediately they, they want to apologize for something as if, as if, as Americans, they should be apologizing to me. Um, and I want to say, look, if you, and, and when you get into it, when you get into the psychology, it's actually very condescending because it's as if um, the Iranian people and the Iranian regime have no agency. The only actor is the United States, and the United States can only do wrong. Um, I think if we're going to get Iran policy right, and if we're going to, thank you so much. If we're going to get Iran policy right, and we're going to get, uh, generally speaking, foreign policy and America's role in the world right, we have got to get out of this posture of self-blame, and we have to get back in touch with what made America the country that injected itself into World War II and changed the course of world history. 
Um, we have to, e and, and not even that far back, I, I served in the former Yugoslavia as a humanitarian aid worker. I worked there for three years. Uh, Bill Clinton um, essentially bombed the, the, the places that I worked every day, and people were extremely grateful for the, that bombing and America's role. Um, there's a big, big debate right now that is happening on both the, the left and the right. The panel with uh, Ray Take was very good, I thought, on this point in particular, um, where isolationism is being shared by both parties. So, you know, on every issue that you can possibly imagine, Democrats and Republicans are divided. The country is, I don't think it's ever been this divided, but what, does ever, what, what did the two parties agree on? That the people of Afghanistan should be betrayed. So you're saying that- I mean, shame on us. Shame on us as Americans that that is the point that we come to agree on. So you're saying that it is not because of the Iran lobby that uh, we have issues with Western media. Uh, you think that they, are, they, have, have, they have their own biases, um, Mm -hmm. and they have their own agenda. Exactly. And based on that, they are trying to cover Iran. And once you know, uh, their agenda matches with you know, what Iranian peoples are demanding or not, uh, th that's how they approach uh, yeah. coverage the, of Iran. Exactly, to the point where if they see protests in Iran, they want to shut it off. They don't want, it's an inconvenience. It's a wrench in the works. When the Green Movement was happening, Bar uh, Barack Obama quite literally didn't want to look at it because it disturbs the progressive point of view. No, these people are pro-American. They want regime change. They see that if their country does not have a fundamentally different kind of government, a democratic government, not a totalitarian regime, there's absolutely no chance that any of the problems that they have will be solved. Honor killings, the environment, the economy, children's rights, uh, there isn't anything that can possibly become better as long as this regime exists. And the West doesn't have the, the willingness to hear that truth. Can I, can I just step in? Sorry, I, I know I'm, I'm speaking out of turn, but I just want to offer a clarification on something Mariam said, because I understand how Twitter works. So Mariam just said, you know, I was in Yugoslavia and people were thankful for the bombing, and you can just see tomorrow Twitter it's going okay. crazy. So I just want to point out, you're not saying people were thankful for the bombing. They were thankful for the results of the, you yes. know, the freedom and the life saved as a result well, of the bombing. Well, actually, so. quite literally, when the bombing was happening, they were going to the rooftops of the, and, I've, and I, <laughs> the regime took this part of my speech and yeah. uh, used it. It's okay, they can do it again. Um, <laughs> and they were celebrating the fact that they were getting bombed. I will say this, Kosovo is not a very big place, it's not as complicated, and precision guided missiles, uh, precision guided bombing worked extremely well there. Um, but they sacrificed enormously. Those people's livelihoods were destroyed. They lost people in the war because they were fighting, but they knew that they had no chance of a future without that war. If Thank I can, you, Mayam. Let's tell a very quick story. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when I was at the State Department and Xi Yue Wang, uh, the prisoner who was rescued, um, came back to the State Department to brief us on his time in Iran, he told us a story from when he was in the Evan prison that they would have the televisions on, and any time the United States announced new sanctions on Iran, the entire prison would burst out in applause. And these were the people who were actually the, the victims of Iran. They knew that what was happening with sanctions was, it was perhaps a tough medicine that was good for the Iranian people and those who had suffered under them. So just one, Yeah, uh, Gabriel, yeah. You, have, uh, you have an inside uh, perspective of, perspective of uh, Iran policy making at the State Department. What do you think are some of the flaws of uh, Western media coverage towards Iran? Sure, so I, I served as the Director of Communications and Congressional Relations for both uh, Special Representative Hook and, and Elliot Abrams. Um, one thing that, that you do in that job is you read every single piece of reporting that comes out on Iran in English. So I would literally read anything that, that covered uh, the country. I, I noticed a few things in my, in my time there. One was a really disproportionate um, focus on the nuclear file and on 
sort of diplomacy questions and really sort of ignoring much of the rest of the Iran question, whether that be its, its foreign activities, whether that be its domestic activities towards um, the Iranian people, but also even just internal politics. And it became clear to me um, that this was a very intentional act and really good stage management by the Iranian government. And I'll give you an example. Um, there were five periods in 2019 and 2020 when Iran um, accelerated its nuclear program, and they did this every 60 days. And what they would do is there are very few times when you actually hold press conferences where you invite foreign journalists. But every time they announced new nuclear steps of escalation, they would invite foreign journalists, all the domestic journalists. They would announce these steps in public, hold everything. They'd release things in English and Farsi and in other languages. This is not the behavior of a country that is trying to sneakily get a nuclear weapon. This is the behavior of a country that wants to use its nuclear program to intimidate the West and, and cause people in capitals like Washington and Brussels and Berlin to freak out and, and say, hey, we need to have a, a, new, a negotiation. And the issue is that Western media largely falls for the framing that the Islamic Republic wants it to cover. Um, they mostly covered the statements of then Foreign Minister Zarif, and they almost entirely ignored the statements and policy discussions coming from the Supreme Leader's Office, coming from the IRGC, uh, the Ministry of Intelligence at the MOIS, which are the real power brokers in the Iranian system. It's almost like if you were a foreign journalist and only the only thing you ever covered was either Voice of America or USAID and you said that they were representative of the US government and the power centers. It's just not, you know, the foreign ministry is a place where bureaucrats go to pitch the Islamic Republic's image to the West. That's not, you know, you don't get much useful information there about the, Republic, the Islamic Republic's real intentions. The other thing is, and this is, and I'm gonna, I'll, I'll criticize the media, by, media, but I wanna give them some credit, which is they're under, enormous financial hardship due to the way that the media the whole enterprise has shifted over the last couple of decades. So I'll, I, want to, I want to give them a little credit um, and say they don't have the number of reporters that they used to be able to have. They can't have three reporters covering Iran. And if they only have one, they're probably going to have to do the nuclear file because that's what most people pay attention to. But as a result, there's just a lack of coverage of domestic issues, corruption, um, treatment of human rights, um, how any examination of Iran's budget. Iran's budget is one of the most useful things that any Iran analyst and every member of the public should really dive into. If you did, you would see things like the Expatriates Project, which is $104 million that the foreign ministry spends on influencing operations and views of, of the Iranian diaspora abroad. No one knows about that. No one's, no one's covered it. These are the things They're that the reporters... They're people attacking dissidents on social media Ex platforms. Exactly. And so when you start digging into it, you start seeing the real Iran. So there are... Some, now, I also want to give credit. There are institutions like Radio Farda uh, and Iran Wire that actually do have phenomenal coverage. But I think the issue is that most sort of mainstream um, top Western media companies either don't have the experience, they don't have enough Farsi speakers who can go in and, and read you know, the politics of the Majlis and and what's really going on in Iran. And so they're reduced to reporting on what is spoon-fed to them by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is effectively just their external propaganda service. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think you know, the American public and the Western public would be much better served um, by looking at me at, at the reporters who actually report in-depth stories inside the Islamic Republic of the politics, of the, of the deliberations there and they would slowly see the ideology that underpins the decision making. It's not of a country aggrieved because of Western sanctions. It's a country that's led by radical um, and revolutionary Islamic ideology. Uh, thank you, Gabriel. So we have heard uh, from three of our panelists so far. We are going to turn to uh, Tina. Uh, Tina, I know that uh, you're working for, uh, for a very um, popular uh, uh, diaspora-based outlets, and I know that you are in touch with Iranians on a daily uh, basis. Uh, based on your experience covering Iran and being in touch with Iranians, um, can you tell us like what are some of the challenges that uh, 
um, Western media have in terms of covering Iran? So uh, first of all, thank you for having me. This is my first interna international trip in two years, thanks to Corona, so I'm really excited <laughs> about it. And thank you for putting up such an amazing event together. Um, I believe uh, covering Iran for the Western media imposes three main challenges. Um, there are different channels and sources that you can get the news from. Um, the first goes to the mainstream news agencies, such as AP, Reuters, uh, who have correspondence uh, in Iran. Um, but the problem is that, uh, and their correspondence, they have a presence in Iran, which is quite restricted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to give you an example. In um, 1999, uh, Geneva Abdo and her husband uh, were two journalists in Iran. She was freelancing for Guardian, and her husband was the head of AP. So it was the time that uh, everybody, all the Western media focused on uh, Khatami, he was the president, and it was like everybody was writing about, reporting about reforms in Iran as if some sort of um, social upheaval is happening. And then at the time, she was the only one who was working on an article, and she was saying, well, actually, this guy doesn't do anything. So she came to London, um, she wanted to, she met my colleague, and she said, uh, my visa is up for renewal, uh, but it is likely that they're not going to renew my visa because of the piece that I'm working on. So this gave a glimpse to my colleague that this is some sort of blackmailing journalist if they don't want to uh, write something that is not in favor of Islamic Republic. And actually, that is exactly what happened. So her visa didn't get renewed. She didn't get kicked out of Iran, obviously. Her visa just didn't get renewed. The problem is that the correspondents, want, they don't want to get kicked out of Iran. So they've got a very good standard of living. They've got very well, uh, they've got a good salary. They get uh, well dined and wine, and they want to keep that presence. But what is compromised here is the truth being told. So they are somehow manipulated uh, by the regime. Another example that I want to give you was James Muir, who was the correspondent of BBC a few years ago. And um, they assigned him to work on a documentary about Zahra Kazemi, an Iranian-Canadian journalist who was murdered by the Islamic Republic. And um, he, he was working on a documentary. And he had to start his documentary with the so-called 1953 coup. So he had to criticize Shah first. Uh, to be able to uh, make a documentary about Zahra Kazemi. Some sort of preconditions. Exactly. So this shows how the Western journalists inevitably become the conduit of narratives highly favored by the Islamic Republic propaganda, um, which is actually for external use, like such as every current foreign policy uh, is the outcome of so-called 1953 coup. I think we're familiar with that sort of a story. And the other thing, based on my own experience, if we want to use a report that was done by the APO Reuters in Iran, if we want to use the footage, the first thing that you see on the screen, there is a message that says, no access to Manoto TV, no access to Voice of America, VOA Persian, no access to BBC Persian. What does that tell you? There is some sort of an agreement that um, somehow we cannot use that. So the truth is being compromised, and these correspondents are being manipulated. And unfortunately, they put up with this just to keep that presence in, the, uh, in yeah. Iran. Yeah. Uh, so many people talk about how uh, the Western media gets Iran uh, wrong. But they also say that some of them, the reason they get it wrong or they don't have a full coverage of you know, Iran issues and a range of issues is that they don't have a journalist on the ground. Or even if they do, their movement is very restricted. So based on your experience, uh, you know, obviously you don't have a journalist uh, you know, in Iran, but what are some alternative ways that uh, you can report Iran issues uh, or Iran internal affairs human rights violation, democracy promotion issues, without having 
official journalists on the ground. Well, David, we have thousands of correspondents in Iran. Actually, I'm going to tell you how. Uh, but before I get to that point, I want to mention another challenge, which is the trends in Western media market that uh, somehow dictates the subjects and narratives that jo the journalists are covering. So and I'm going to give you another example, good example of that. Um, there was an article in Guardian um, about the, how sanctions causing the shortage of medicine in Iran. And they gave an example of a boy, um, hemophilia boy, who uh, died because of the shortage of drug, hemophilia drug in Iran. And then we, we chased up the story. We followed the story. We found the family of the boy. It was very difficult, and we did that. And thanks, that, that was thanks to our correspondents in Iran. I mean, citizen journalists in Iran. We could find the boy. And then uh, we find out that he, didn't, he died because of the hiking accident. He was on the way to the hospital. He was taken to the hospital, and he died because of the hemorrhage. So it had got nothing to do with the uh, shortage of drug. In fact, a year ago, uh, Iran announced that we are self-sufficient in uh, providing hemophiliac drugs. So, but the story was touching. It was a human story, and it worked very well within the uh, politically correct narrative. So it got copy and pasted, copy and pasted. Uh, yeah, so we have almost like 10 minutes left. I want to ask a few other questions okay, okay, from our, sure. our, our panelists, and we will get back to you if you have uh, time. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Mariam, I have a question for you. Uh, there are so many activists inside the country that, uh, in my opinion, uh, they risk their lives, but they don't have a voice uh, in the Western media. Um, as he talked about, when the Western media uh, is covering Iran, these kind of people, activists, you know, um, political prisoners, they are almost non-existent. What are some ways that Iranian, Iran's, Iranians inside the country can get, uh, uh, you know, publicized in, um, in uh, Western media? And uh, are there any risks to it? Well, the risks are enormous. Um, you know, Iran, the Islamic Republic is a regime that that um, that tortures people, puts them in very, very small cells, solitary confinement for very long periods of time, denies medical care, um, denies family visits, denies any communication, um, constantly holds the threat of execution above people's heads, long interrogations, um, in and out of prison, even when they are not in prison, constant intimidation, threats to the family. So any kind of dissent by any kind of person is a huge act of courage. Um, to, to, let me answer your question in two ways. One is that obviously social media has been enormous, enor an enormous opportunity that Iranians have taken full advantage of. The regime knows this and has especially recently started, uh, well, I don't know, maybe three, three years uh, has been especially strong in creating via its so-called cyber army um, fake accounts that pretend that, that, are, that are posturing to be uh, monarchists or posturing to be super, uh, super barandos, super against the regime. And what these accounts do is they amplify, they, they seed extremist discourse and they amplify extremist discourse and they amplify uh, accounts which may be real, real accounts of real people when they go after people in the opposition. I started to learn about this because of attacks on me. So they're pretending <laughs> to be uh, opposition but they are not. Exactly. Exactly. They're pretending to be opposition but they're not. Why would the regime do that? Because the regime knows that it has no legitimacy. It has no reputation. It can't attract people by going on Twitter and saying 
great things about the Islamic Republic. Nobody's gonna, that's not gonna galvanize anybody. It's not gonna reson, resonate. Uh, but, but the Islamic Republic has no reputation anymore, so it, they it, have to it, pretend that. Exactly, so yeah. they have to go after the reputation of, of people in the opposition. So social media is a, a key way that they do it. I'll go very quickly. Um, the other way, which has, which has been very few and far in between, um, is by writing in English. And recently, Hussein Ronaqi, who's a, um, uh, an activist and a writer inside the country, he also tweets in English, wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal. And this is a person who uh, has, been to, has been imprisoned for six years. He's out now, imprisoned for six years, tortured. He lost one kidney because of the torture. And he, wow. he dared, he braved to write in the Wall Street Journal about his experience and that he will likely face torture again. But he tried very hard to shame, and good on the Wall Street Journal for publishing it, shame all of Western media for portraying uh, Iran in a way that is really just not truthful. And he calls it the real Iran. And when he tweets, he says, the real Iran is about this. The real Iran is about, and, and all, the, all, the, all the negative things that, as Kava says, the Iran lobby just doesn't want you to know about. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Uh, Gabriel, I have another question for you. You have worked for both of Iran's uh, envoys who are here today, uh, uh, Mr. Abrams and Brian Hook, and I know that you were directly in charge of USA, the RFRC, the Persian media uh, outlets, um, in, uh, outlets for Iranians uh, run by the State Department. Um, how do you think the Biden administration is uh, doing in terms of messaging to Iran with the same task that uh, uh, you in were in charge of two very years? Very disappointing. Well, it's two words. Um, so so as, as means of, of background, this program was actually created by uh, President uh, Barack Obama as a means to connect with the Iranian people. We didn't have the embassy in Iran because it was taken over. So we created digital programs to try to communicate to the Iranian people, to reach out to them and really show them that the United States was not what the Islamic Republic called, said it was. Um, during the Trump administration, we supercharged these programs and um, together with my colleague, Glenn Kodorkovsky, we um, got to two million followers and we were the 18th most powerful social media platform in the world. We were ahead of Boris Johnson, Angela Merkel, Emmanuel Macron. Um, it was the most, second most popular political account uh, in America besides uh, President Trump's accounts. Um, unfortunately, since then, um, this administration has really completely neglected the platforms. They've actually shut off some of the channels, say on Telegram. Um, they have atrophied followers left and right. They've lost about 50,000 followers on Instagram. Intentionally. In, in, in the past year. Arguably, intentionally, the, the employees are well aware of what's happened. Um, they have posts about the, the great modest clothing companies and they feature people in hijab, despite the fact that uh, there are women suffering decades in prison in Iran um, for not having the choice to wear hijab. Um, they post things in English. They have, they have intentionally neutered the platform. I don't make that accusation lightly because these are my old colleagues. Um, but they have neutered the platform and they are not talking about human rights intentionally because they believe that if they don't talk about human rights, they can get a nuclear deal with Iran. And that if they don't offend the Iranian leaders who still believe that they need to destroy America, they can yeah, perhaps um, get this deal. It's, uh, a, it's a really disappointing and sad uh, deal. Our time is one. almost up, but I want to uh, ask you uh, a very uh, uh, quick question. And that is that... Um, uh, what would you suggest to the U.S. government uh, in terms of dealing with the Iran disinformation campaign and the ways in which their methods uh, or their new methods can be identified? Sorry, that's for me? Yeah, that's for you. Um, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, I, th I think for them to be more effective, they have to actually have a proper understanding of what's happening in Iran, and I don't think um, this administration does. So, first of all, listen to somebody like Mr. Ronari, figure out what the real Iran is, right? Um, secondly, don't do what they've been doing with respect to the existing channels of communication. Don't, uh, you know, actually focus on, on what the um, Iranian people uh, are, are fighting for. 
Um, they're not fighting for modesty in clothing. They're fighting for you know, freedom to, to, to choose how they want to live their lives. Um, and then finally, I think it, it involves changing the narrative a little bit. Stop focusing, I, I think Gabriel said it beautifully, we're allowing the Iranian regime to set the framework for our discussion. The framework should not be um, you know, the effect of sanctions or um, you know, any issue but how tyrannical Iran's regime is and the fact that Iranian people want peace with the world, they want freedom, they want to enjoy the very things that we enjoy living here in the West. That should be our messaging in Canada, in the United States, everywhere in the world. And until we get that right, we're going to continue to have this problem. We're going to continue to have the Iran lobby's influence um, subverting our discourse and, and getting it off course. Uh, thank you, Kabe. Um It was very interesting. I really enjoyed uh, all of your contributions. So, so I want to open the stage for questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions for our panelists. Can I use this opportunity okay. to... Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 Mrs. Guru Mand, yes, go ahead. Um, the answer to that is quite simple, uh, Lada and John. Uh, you, know, for, you know that for 40, almost 43 years, uh, the, our history was distorted. So what was shown to the generation after the Islamic Revolution, it was just the part, the lie and the propaganda and the dark part that the Islamic Republic wanted the, this generation to believe. But then what we thought we need to show to this generation is another part that hasn't been shown. Uh, and then that, that was part of the story that we covered, the good part, the good part that uh, give the uh, Iranian generation a vision, a vision for the future. There were many, I'm, I'm not saying everything was uh, great and amazing, obviously there were mistakes, but there were many good things that, that can actually be inspirational for the future of Iranians. And the other thing is that it's much more easier to, when you know that you had something, it's much more easier to work through it to get it again in the future. When you don't have it at all, it's really difficult. For example, if in Saudi Arabia, if you go and say, tell to women that obligatory veil is bad and then we need to fight against that, they, they never had it. It's, it takes much more time, it's much more difficult. But then with Iranians, it's, it's different. We had it before, so we just show it to them. So it's much easier to get to the point that we want to get to the future. And now, okay. can I mention the, um, question, uh, something quickly about the questions you ask about how we are connected. Yeah, just one minute, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we've got thousands of uh, correspondents in Iran, and that is thanks to the whole idea of citizen journalism that uh, we, we introduced to Iranian uh, media. Ten years ago when Manato uh, started, was started, we knew that we are not in Iran, so how we can compen compensate for that, how we can feel connected. So we started this idea of um, citizen journalism, which we call Gozareshkar. And I don't know who the patient zero was who said, I don't know even how to translate it. But whatever happens all across the country, even the road is, when the road is blocked, they take out their uh, cell phones and they're uh, recording this for us and sending it, this to us. Many other TV channels try to do the same thing, but it's not that easy. It's a matter of trust that you build that is built between that channel and the people. Is that trust, that trust is not an easy thing to achieve and it happens over time. And I can talk about it uh, for yeah, two days, but yeah, I know we don't I have wish we had more time. So we're gonna take one last question from 
Mr. Shahyar Ahi, please be short in responding. Go ahead. In, uh, question to Gabrielle. Imagine the first war where only one side had a machine gun. That's the situation between the West and the East. The weapon is state-sponsored anonymous messaging. It's illegal in the West. The best source of information by Stratcom of NATO in Riga is abundantly rich with AI analysis of communication between 40 million Iranians who speak on Telegram with each other, 30 million on Instagram, but it's illegal for them to release it to the press. It's illegal for them to do it anonymously, whereas Iran, Moscow, China spend huge amounts of money doing precisely that. Hamid Reza Shari, who got his Eau de Pong academic equivalent to Le Jeune Bonneau, from the president of France, teaches students who go and build narratology engines in different institutions in Iran, competing against each other sometimes, but getting together on major affairs of the state. And there are masters of narratology armed by condensed state-rich information. How can you win that war? Can you be brief, please? Sure. So, you know, people might not think about this, but one of the things that maximum pressure did was it actually started destroying the Iranian regime's propaganda network. And I'll give you a quick example how um, IRIB um, broadcasts in dozens of languages, or they did, until they started running out of foreign currency reserves to pay for satellites to actually broadcast that. So at the peak of maximum pressure, they stopped broadcasting to Dari, they stopped broadcasting into Hindi, and they had to limit their Spanish language propaganda network. So they didn't even have the money to, to do all these things. Um, this, was a, this was a nation that was under economic collapse. And so all these things, you know, again, look at their budget and look at how much they had, they could, they tried to spend on their expatriates product, their their uh, their budget request, and then how much their parliament was actually able to fulfill for it. Same with IRIB, uh, all these programs. You know, money is the sinews of war. Is is an old saying that we had at the State Department. When you take away that money, their ability to spread propaganda, their ability to oppress their people, all these things go away. Um, you know, sanctions. You know, sanctions have that ability to stand with the Iranian people because you take away the tools of their oppressors. You think that, that by sanctioning, that you take away their ability to, to repress the people too? That's a hard question. Because the, the 1,500 the, were, were killed under maximum pressure. And I'll, and I'll give account, I'll even make your argument stronger. Unfortunately, what we saw under maximum pressure is what they did is they took money from health care accounts, from education accounts, and they put it in the besiege. So, yeah, they can always you know, that do was, that. You know, when I saw that, that wasn't a pretty answer. What I was seeing was they're actually, you know, guns versus butter. They're saying we're taking away butter, but we're poking more guns, and those are guns that can be killed Iranians. They're never sure for It's not, yeah. you know, if you look at it, Venezuela, same picture. We thought you could get regime collapse and that you could do regime change by doing massive sanctions. What it ended up happening is the regime chose that it was going to kill their people. It's not a pretty answer. It's Thank not you, as Gabriel. clear as you think it is. Thank you very much. I actually had some other questions for, uh, for all of you, but our time is up. Uh, we're just going to end the panel right now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.